Hello and welcome to The Girls We Left Behind, four episodes which reflect on the changing role of women over the last hundred years. This project is supported by the Good Relations Department of Fermanagh and Oma District Council. As part of the project, we had planned to include an interview with some Russian ladies about the legacy that World War I had on their families and communities. But in light of recent and tragic events in Ukraine, we thought it unwise and potentially unsafe to expose our Russian friends to potential sanction from their dysfunctional regime. We hope to re-engage with this part of the project at some future and more settled date. But for now, we're going to continue with a tune written in the 1920s called Avalon. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to the first episode of The Girls We Left Behind. We are here with Mary McCartan and Bob Quick and my name's Gerda McCann. Mary, I'll introduce you first because you have a whole litany of titles. <laughs> so Mary, um, you were involved in your teenage years with the family business of videoing and editing. Right. I think you've probably done so many weddings in Ireland, never mind, probably uh, further afield as well with your, your lovely mum and dad. You're a registered nurse. You've been president of the OMA Chamber of Commerce. You're an independent child protection trainer. You're an entrepreneur, of course, so many people will remember Treehouse in your days. And wonderfully for this uh, project, you are one of the founding members of the network of enterprise, enterprising women in OMA and Fermanagh. That's right. And this, of course, ties in with our whole concept um, of these shows called The Girls We Left Behind. And Bob, we came up with this idea through conversation with yourself, yeah. Paul Maguire, and, and me. And we were talking about great maiden aunts yes. and family histories and that. And suddenly yeah. discovered that the great maiden aunts we had, and Mary, you as well, of course, mm -hmm. weren't married. Yeah. And thinking... Well, why weren't they married? Yes. And of course, they weren't married because of World War One, World War Two, and the millions of men and soldiers who were killed yep. uh, were were gone out of our lives. Yes. Out of ten our million, ten million soldiers across both sides in World War One. So that was ten million men that weren't available as as husbands and spouses for for. My Aunt Flossie, my Aunt Ivy, your aunt... My Aunt Minnie, my great Aunt Minnie, my great Aunt Tilly. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, whole, the whole experience of growing up and being able to, to go out and interact, and, which COVID actually threw into our present day here with yes. our teenagers. Now, we're in no way saying that to be a fulfilled woman, you have to get married and mm. have to have to have children or want to have children. Right. But the opportunity wasn't they there. They should have the opportunity. Yes. And those young men were brothers and nephews and grandchildren and husbands and sons. And yes. that was taken. That was taken completely yeah. away. Absolutely, it away was. from us all. And but some, in some ways, that might have been a real positive change. You know, because women then had to make different arrangements to survive. They had to find work. They mm -hmm. had to, uh, you know, and the war also gave them opportunity to work because the factories needed them. Yes. You know, um, you know, our, they had even in Belfast they had to make aeroplanes out of linen. You know, the, the aeroplane wings. Yeah. Uh, and all down this coast, or all down this side of the, the of Northern Ireland, the women were working and needed to go to the factories to make clothes and all those yeah. things as well. So there was a big change socially as well as 
you know, not getting married, but maybe there was a choice not to get married as well, yeah. uh, which wasn't there. I had two aunts who went to live, work, a grand aunts who went to live in Dublin and worked in, in, uh, in shops and became, sh you know, um, sh uh, yeah, I mean, a whole opportunity out of Castle Derry to go and, and, and find yes. a new way to live mm -hmm. and came back with their money and, uh, you know, lived independently. Yeah. I also have aunts on the other side of my family who went to, our grand aunts, I should say, went to America and came back and lived out their lives independently as a single yeah. woman. So, uh, it's you know, if they wanted to get married, fine, but if they didn't, they didn't have men, yes. possibly, but also, if they didn't want to get married, they had better choices. And a lot of these women who, who we talk in our episodes as the girls we left behind, mm. these women particularly who travelled off to America or travelled off to Scotland or wherever, um, travelled on their own. On their own. On their own. Mm -hmm. And hence the girls we left behind are the girls that we lost because so many of the women heading off weren't married. That's right. Therefore, uh, very difficult to keep track of when we're in the privileged mm -hmm. position that we are in now to be able to look back at histories and that's and our, our heritage and our genealogy. Well, that's that's one of my hobbies is genealogy, and we've been looking at those again, looking at those records, leaving uh, the the ports of Belfast or leaving the ports of uh, Cork mm -hmm. or leaving the ports of of, of um, you know, down on the foil as well. And there was so many lists of single women and also children, young children going as well, you know, on their own to maybe to somebody. But the other thing is, what, you know, we talk about genealogy. The women have disappeared out of our family histories. We talk about the son of, the son of, usually the oldest son of, and the, and the family tree goes back through the men. But when you have to actually study geology and when, uh, uh, genealogy, and then also when you're studying DNA, the woman come all back to life again. Okay. Because, you know, there's always a man and a woman's genes coming down through the... Through the uh, through the DNA, yeah. oh, the DNA is coming down through. Uh, so the the uh, it's really interesting to find the woman again. Yes. And you're talking about the woman that went to America and Australia. It is actually hard to find them because if they went out there as a single woman and got married, you know, it's hard to find the, those families. Yes. Uh, so it is. I, I do think genealogy and mm -hmm. DNA bring these women all back to life again. Our great grandmothers, our great 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 grandmothers. Yeah. Yeah. So you mean if the ladies were travelling from home or or, or Ernestine or whatever to Canada or America and then married local guys, they disappeared. They, they they're, disappeared. They, they disappeared off the records mm. and they were recorded under the, under the husband's name. Yeah, for most people, and I could try it on you, if I was to ask you who your great-great-grandmother was, yes. what was her maiden name? Uh, Church. You've got it, yeah. Yeah. yeah and Possibly not my great yeah. great. No, I have to yeah. say no, that, that was possibly a but, guess. I have to say yes, but you, I, I think he did just bring it up out, out of the brain. But you know, but talk about your great 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 grandfather. You probably have a good idea what his name is. Church, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was your great great grandmother's uh, husband. Married name. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No comments. Maiden name. Yeah. No but idea. these these women who who disappeared. These women who were lost. Mm. Um, played such a vital role in our lives and, and not just our lives mm. as women but you know men's lives yeah. as well because it's all so intertwined it is. and they had to survive mm -hmm. now this in no way takes away from the millions and millions of men of course who paid with their lives That's right. and life was hard mm. for women as well mm -hmm. but Mary as you had said about women going abroad um, women were making clothes you know, for the children, mm -hmm. for for neighbours, mm -hmm. women were baking. Um, I know we'll be talking to a lovely lady um, later on in some of the episodes who there, you know, they were preparing the the straw for thatching roofs. Mm -hmm. Very very important work that kept life ticking by. And then the war came, mm -hmm. and they had to step out of of their mothering roles or yes. of their roles of caring for elderly parents or mm. for other parts of society mm. and say, OK, that's who I am, mm -hmm. but I need to step up to the mark now. Yeah, it's interesting how in history women are brought out to be important when they're needed. So, you know, like the Spitfires were nearly all made by women. Yes. Yeah. Um, so 
so when they were needed, they were pulled out into the factories. If you take Straban and Derry, all that, the, it was the woman who went out into the factories. Yeah. The men ran the show after the war, post war, but post First World War. Uh, so the thing is, is that you know when they're needed, they're brought to the front. It's like looking back through the ancient genealogy. You see that you don't hear about any of the women except when the men married a, the daughter of somebody for a strategic, mm. uh, you know, an alliance. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that then you hear about, you know, that uh, one of the uh, O'Neills married Hugh O'Donnell's daughter. Yeah, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So uh, otherwise, then they don't mention the woman. But so every so often in history, the woman's name comes really forward. Yes. And she comes out and she does what's needed to be done. You know, even thinking about the peace process here, the Women's Coalition or Mo Molan or any of those yes. who came forward, yeah. they'd done their bit, they negotiated and they were in, you know, they, they, they'd done their bit and then they just seep back into wherever the mm. obscurity of, of And life. I suppose back in the early 1900s, women were still doing that, but there was no, there was no real recognition. I'm not saying that we need or want recognition, but there wasn't. There was the home lives, there was the, the normality of surviving, mm. and then there was stepping forward when we're needed, stepping into the munitions factories, yeah. stepping into the, uh, the Spitfire, the Spitfire making, yeah. making yeah. factories. Mm -hmm. And then, I think as women are really good at, just ebb back. Head back in. Head I was back. watching a program there about the, Amer um, about the American woman during the Second World War. They became welders. Absolutely, they ran all the factories welding, like yeah. all sorts of uh, like, uh, war warships. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. know, heavy welding. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason, Mary, then for you're saying after the First World War, but the, the women in in Fermanagh and Tyrone and Derry continued to work in the shirt factories. They did. Uh, and was that because the shirt factory owners? could pay women less than would pay men. So was it a, was that a financial consideration, you think? I would think it's just the skills, because those women oh, okay. were for years running, uh, they, uh, they were sewing at home. Oh. I, had, I had a row of five grand-aunts, great grand-aunts actually they were, who were all seamstresses, and they were all making very fine uh, clothes for the gentry. Okay. And but in their own homes. Art straw, yeah. 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 And so art professional straw. seamstresses. Yeah, professional seamstresses, yeah. And you take like the woman of Donegal who were making the tweeds and making, yeah. you know, you know the, and the irons. Yeah. Like they were, they, that's how they survived. There was no way of surviving in Donegal otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, the men were generally, and some of the women were going to Scotland and gathering potatoes and working on the, yeah. the, the, in the cities and coming, you know, sending some money back. But actually, the, just in the houses, it was the the woman just making clothes that made the difference. Yeah. So I, I suppose post-war we started to see really the factories you know, and it did it, I suppose that they, those women were qualified to do it. Yeah. They were, yes. you know, yeah. were and the bus that's where the business was going that's and that's where the, where the work was, was. That's right. and the need for you know the, the more beautiful clothes was not as important no. but then they lost their livelihood they lost possibly you know part of their independence yeah as well. That's right. Uh, and was this was this linen based or was this cotton based coming in from America or whatever? Oh well, it, it was uh, uh, that was in in Donegal. You're talking about the iron, so you know you're yeah. talking about uh, the, the knitting, yes. the big, big knitting industry. And yeah. so then um, here we're dealing with cotton. I think most of the factories along yeah. here, but uh, this whole area was flax grown. They they grew the flax here, and the fa factories were in the east. But the flax was grown all over this area okay. here. Yeah, and that's continued right through mm. for the last hundred years. I mean, mm. Oma had its the shirt factory. Yeah, that uh, which was uh, the only provided. job opportunity we used to be offered in school. You know, when we were at school in this, uh, well, I was sort of late seventies, early eighties. You know, that was the kind of the choice for, you know, the the girls like that. You know, do you want to work in the shirt factory or do you want to? Um, I think they might have offered uh, thinking about nursing actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or um, I remember with my sister when she was going through school and she always, always wanted to have a job where she would be typing on a typewriter. Oh, yeah. And I remember the typewriter being in her house and Oh, yes. Yeah. And that's, she wanted yeah. a job where yeah. she could do that. We had the lovely, well, we've unfortunately lost the lovely Bob Lingwood. Um, yes. uh, yeah. over a month, of months. month yes. ago, uh -huh. and of course he had the shoe factory of in Oma as well. Of and of course, you know we're from Oma and mm -hmm. we're from Tyrone, so mm -hmm. so we're we're very aware of all of that. But having said, at school at that stage, you and being encouraged to go into the factories, 
it was jobs. Well, the town needed you to work. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, the town needed you. I mean, you were offered, you know, I suppose the idea of secretarial skills and learn shorthand and those sorts of things. But, um, but I wanted to be an air hostess, and uh, you know, my. I think you'd be wonderful. Yes, until I lost my, you know, one, once I went short sighted at about fourteen, that was option was gone because you had to look pretty to be an air hostess, so you couldn't wear glasses. That <laughs> is so with a woman you couldn't. I'm sure the men, the air stewards could, but the woman couldn't wear glasses. Isn't that horrendous? Yeah. Oh, when you think back, how bad it was. But anyway, but anyway, my careers teacher had no idea what to do with me. Yeah. There's a vet, but the, well, of course, but with the air stewardess, it's very glamorous. I don't actually think it's as glamorous as it's made out to be. No, but it was the travel. In those days, and you know, you used to have layovers and everything, so you were you, you could be in Australia for a couple of you know a week before yes, you come okay, back yeah. and things like that. Yeah, it was very glamorous but, then. But uh, bizarre nowadays, when we think it was all about the look, it was all about, all about the, the, look. the yeah. packaging. Mm-hmm. And I know mm-hmm. uh, Bob, you had mentioned um, in the police. Yes, as yeah, well, yeah, it was yeah. if you were short sighted. Yes. I was so hopeless at school that my parents didn't know what to do with me. <coughs> and my, I remember my, my <laughs> mum saying, "Hard to believe." We know how they <laughs> think. <laughs> you were an artiste. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my mum saying, "You can't even join the police because you wears glasses." <laughs> and apparently that was the thing. I don't think it's true now. But back in uh, the, in the sixties and seventies when I was growing up, yeah, if you wore you glasses, you, you couldn't be in the cops. You know? Whereas <laughs> now it's such a fashion accessory. In fact, I know a lovely wee girl who goes who goes to one of the local schools, and she wears glasses with no glass in them. Excellent, <laughs> because Brilliant. she loves the look it's and is like, oh, I wish I was short sighted, long sighted. Yeah. And then uh-huh. no, you don't have to be, mm-hmm. or or just have yeah. have clear glass, glass, whatever. Clear glass. It's yes. a whole fashion mm-hmm. accessory. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, how time have changed oh hopefully they're changed enough to not go back yeah, yeah definitely yes but how how desperately sad that over the next few shows we'll also unfortunately be comparing the reality of war where we are now mm-hmm. yeah. and looking at women children men having to to face that decision yes do i stay do I flee? Mm-hmm. And just um, when you were talking about young women and sometimes children heading off to America back in the early 1900s yes. and trying to forge lives for themselves, uh, there, there was a, a fabulous interview on TV and um, an 11-year-old boy mm. travelled over 700 miles across yeah. the Ukraine That's right, yes. with a telephone number and an address written wow. on his hand how yeah. desperate was his mother to make sure he was safe and you know this it's uh, you know but uh, when people use when we like we went to america when we were late teens as well but we went because we wanted to find something new and interesting and a bit of excitement and or i mean a new life it could life might have been desperate here even during the famine life and you needed to go and look for something new but when you are a refugee in a war situation, that's not the same thing. No. Because you have no choices. And what I find interesting about, uh, you know, if we want to talk about the male-female difference, men are, you know, interested in war. You know, they do, they are more interested in war. But I can't understand why they want to bring a war into cities and into towns and fight it over the top of children and old people and women. Like, why not go, like, macho men in the night in, in the in the dark ages go out into a big field and fight together but fighting it and over the top of children but as a woman i just don't understand uh, well i don't understand it either mm. but i also i feel so strongly for the men mm. for those soldiers those men those yeah, sons choice. those husbands mm. who back in the 1900s and now in 2022, mm-hmm. are being told they must. You must go and do it. Mm. So Russians and Ukrainian conscripts. Yeah, both the same. Absolutely. All, all conscripted. It's always the same on either side of war. I wrote a book about war. Of course. And um, about the Second World War. But that's what my granduncle was in the Second World War. And get, that's what he said. You know, when war puts his face up against you, there's no, you know, there's no choices. No. You know, you just there's no choices. But there's a minority who are dictating. That's and right. that's that's what I'm saying. I feel for those men mm-hmm. who have to lift arms and go. And I think one of the most striking interviews that I have that I ever heard, and um, it was on RTE, and it was um, a surviving soldier, and the reality of having to step up and say it's you or me, and I'm fighting for me, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because 
they said so. That's right. And Not there's because nothing I in hate you. you. No. And there's nothing in their nature that wants to do it. No. You know, it's just... And the pain that mothers and wives and grandparents and grand grandmothers, wives are feeling today in 2022 are exactly the same feelings. And those feelings are never going away. No. That family is changed forever. Whether it's Britain, Ireland, the Not Ukraine, it. Russia, Syria. France, yeah. anywhere. Mm -hmm. Those Russian lads, Russian lads and Ukrainian lads that have been killed this week, that's their dynasty finished. They, 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 they won't have families, they won't have children, that's they true. won't have grandchildren. That's, that's, that, that's that line wiped out. Mm -hmm. And that's happening today as it was happening 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Just Which, gone. it's important that we do talk about this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there is uh, acres and acres of topics there that is. we will try and cover in the next four shows of The Girls That We Left Behind. Mm -hmm. But so lovely to have you here. Thank you. Um, look forward to seeing you in the next episode uh, as well. And we're going to continue with music now. Oh, great. Um, this actually is uh, one of the music hall songs from back in the early 1900s called I Love Piano. And it's uh, myself and very delighted to be accompanied by Charles Fife. I love piano. I love piano is a wonderful song from the musical Easter Parade. As a child, I went wild when the band played. How I ran to the man when his hand swayed Clarinets were my pets And the slide trombone I thought was simply divine But today when they play I could hiss them Every bar is a jar to my system But there's one musical instrument that I call mine I love a piano I love a piano, I love to hear somebody play Upon a piano, a grand piano, it simply carries me away I know a fine way to treat a stein way I love to run my fingers over the keys, the ivories and with the pedals I love to meddle when Paderewski comes this way. I'm so delighted if I'm invited to hear the long-haired genius play. So you can keep your fiddle and your bow. Give me a P-I-A-N-O. Oh, oh, I love an upright to play the upright. When a green tetrazine starts to warble I grow cold as an old piece of marble I allude to the crude little party singer Who don't know when to pause At her best I detest the soprano But I run to the one at the piano I always love the accompaniment and that because I love a piano, I love a piano, I love to hear somebody play upon a piano, a grand piano, it simply carries me When Paderewski comes this way I'm so delighted if I'm invited To hear the long-haired genius play So you can keep your fiddle and your bow Give me a P-I-A-N-O -oh, oh, I love to stop right beside an upright Or a high-toned baby grand I love to stop right beside an upright
turn to the Philea Sophia Ensemble now and a beautiful plaintive Scottish ballad called Land of the Leal. <laughs> So now we are joined by the lovely Mary Campbell. Mary, would you like to be addressed as Lady Campbell or Lady Mary, Queen Mary? What what do you like? 
Plain Mary. Plain Mary. I, I doubt there's anything plain about you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so I'm, much. I'm a plain Jane. I doubt it. I doubt it. Mary, I did ask your permission, but can you tell us how old you are? Because you're fantastic. Well, if I live till the 30th of April this year, I'll be 92. Oh, my goodness. I was born in 1930, the 30th of April. Good. Gosh, you're amazing. Up in a wee house up in Balladula. And from uh, Anna. And from Anna. My goodness. And you have six boys. Six and boys and one, one girl. One girl. Uh-huh. And um, you said to me before we started recording that there's nothing any boy could do that Mary hasn't experienced. <laughs> or lived through. I've seen done before. I've seen done before is right. So um, I have one son, and I'd be thinking I could definitely have bent your ear over the last few years <laughs> to say what would I do with this. But he's a great boy, I have to say. Pierce, oh, you're a great I, boy. Uh, no such thing. Father Flanagan made a film in America years ago, mm-hmm. and he gathered all these boys into a house. And he said there was no such thing as a bad boy. No. <laughs> no, there's not. There couldn't be. There couldn't be any such thing as a bad child. No. They had, they're, they're a symptom of they their upbringing. They have the wee eye, but mm. you, you can't say they're bad, no. No. Mm. All right. Well, well maybe, maybe Bob Quick's the exception. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> Dangerous conversation. Mary, <laughs> you know th- that this programme that we're doing is called The Girls That We Left Behind, and we're looking at the changes in women's lives since the First World War, you know, so over mm. the last hundred years, and I'm sure you've seen lots of changes as well. Mm-hmm. But just for us to know exactly about about you, your dad was born in Cavan, mm-hmm. and your mum was born in Tattysala. Told her to, yeah. And that's, that's right. where you lived your That's happy right, childhood. the most of my life, yeah. a happy childhood. And you're still in Taddy Sala, aren't still you? Still in Taddy Sala, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah, we were a wee while up in Fermala. And um, we had a very happy life. We didn't have much. Mm-hmm. You know, in those days, you got the spuds out of the field and carrots and made the dinner and maybe a bit of bacon and... Mm-hmm. And would you would you think it was a, a much simpler life then than it is oh now? Oh, aye. Yeah. Oh, it was, surely. We used to go out and play, and we'd tie the rope up on a branch of a bush and put a big hay on it and yeah. swing out of it and played tig mm-hmm. and played ball. And I remember having a dress, and I had it on for three or four days, and it was wild. I was very black and dirty, and my mother took it off and washed it. And we didn't know it the next day when we saw it. It was like a new dress. It was like a new (laughs) dress. That is true. You only had the one. And with with your lovely mum and dad, I mean, can you imagine if they were if, if if they were put into in with us now today? It would be just like a foreign country to them, wouldn't it? Aye. My daddy had a cabin accent. He had a cabin accent? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we right. forgive him for that. Right. <laughs> well, Mummy was Tyrone. Yeah. And she used to sing. Which you do, of course. Aye, uh, she would have sang too. Yeah. Daddy was well about singing too, but she always shouted him down. She said he was a very bad singer. I used to sing a song. Be swallowed tripes and lard, be the yard they were scared. Mickey Flynn knocked the skin off his shin, and they all fought and bled. <laughs> and Molly would say, There never was any such song as that. <laughs> <laughs> you malefactor, that. She used to say malefactor. <laughs> but I would have heard it. Yeah. Some, uh, yeah. yeah. Very good. There is a song. Mary, what, what are your memories of, you know, the. the the war, I remember the, the First World War, I remember you saying, which was news to me, that you had taken in refugees. I that was the Second or World sorry, War. Oh, sorry, Second World War. I, Second World War. You had uh-huh. taken in refugees yes. then. We we had Taddy Sala School 
and there was a family of Taggarts. You'd have heard of Jackie Taggart, mm-hmm. who's a good footballer. And he had, they had cousins out in Tadakil, beside us, next town land to us, and they would all come out and stay there to be safe. Mm-hmm. There was Quinns from Castle Street came out and stayed. And they thought they were safer out there if they came to bomb Oma. You see, th- this this really this surprised what they were me. Of. Yes, but this really surprised me. What well, because when you had said, you know, about the Second World War and your family taking in refugees, I have to say I was thinking refugees from yeah. maybe from from oh, no, England or just... or from where, or... wherever, mm. but. Refugees from Oma, refugees mm-hmm. as you they said then too out. from yeah. from Glasgow, and the yeah. worry was that they would they would bomb, mm-hmm. you know, our wee town in, in yeah. the Second World War. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose the life out in Taddy Sala was was so different even then from the life that they oh, had in Oma. Of course, Aye. it was like yeah. countryside. That was the countryside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Aye, there was no. Well, Oma would have been a garrison town, I think there were yeah. soldiers there, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, they were away out of the road, and usually they waited for them to come and bomb a place where soldiers would be slain, oh, okay. yes. you know, yeah. and that's the yeah. thing why they brought yeah. the children. I'm sorry, I stopped. You're grand. Mm-hmm. You're lovely. Mm-hmm. You're lovely. And I remember you saying also there were the um, some of the American soldiers were in Fintna. Yeah. And Kilides. Yes, I like um, Kilides. Yeah. And they were in Fintna. With your mum and your dad, whenever you, you were all growing up, uh, the workload must have been huge. My and mother would take a mail bag. Mm-hmm. Do you know what a mailbag mm-hmm. is? <laughs> and she would go out to the bog, maybe half a mile or a bit more, and put a few turf in it and carry them home on her back. We had no way of bringing home the turf. Yeah, yeah. We just had to carry them. And, and this was turf that your father would have cut, is mm-hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. He, he had a part of the bog. Okay. He had part of the bog. Got and what, what did you use a turf for, Mary? Was that for the, the, the range to cook? Uh, just an open fire. Yeah. You put on a big fire. Okay. Maybe you'd put on a pot of sponge for the hens. Okay. And when that would be boiled, the fire would be nice and red. And you should get the oven with the coals on top and make a scull of bread. Lovely. And I I bet you there's no better tasting bread than there was that then. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you used the coals from the fire to go in the Uh, oven as well? uh To put up on the lid of the oven. Really? You hung the oven on and put the lid up. Okay. Put the coals on the lid, and then you had to be very careful taking yeah. them down in case some of the ice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, didn't blow and didn't do any harm. Yeah. Yep. Oh, my mother was a first class bread maker. Did you continue that? Would you? I would you just yeah. make bread. Good. I make bread for Peter. You see son. Peter ask him about my bread. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Does he eat it when the butter is just like melting on the yeah, top? Yeah, that's mm. the way they like it. That's the only way to eat it. And sometimes they fry it. Melt the butter on the pan and fry yeah. it. Do you know that reminds me of a story my dad told me because of course his mum, you and my daddy would be about the the same age, and dad used to say when they were going to school his mum would have break bake the bread. But you did, they didn't want the bread that, granny had cooked, they want bread that was bought, you know they they wanted different bread not lovely home cooked bread yeah. and daddy said Shut they used them. to walk up. <laughs> they used to walk up to the corner when they were heading to school, take the bread out of their bags and throw it over the heads because they thought, <laughs> homemade bread, who wants that? And now we, like, we'd be <coughs> paying well, to get it. Yes. Wild about it. That's, That's right. right. Well, and it. appreciating they all it. love it. He mm-hmm. wanted mm-hmm. shop-bought mm-hmm. Yeah. bread. Yeah. And um, our, you were telling us also um, previously about um, the rationing and your mum... Yes, what, to, was it there a was a couple of. Or something? Oh, is that the smuggling? Or the yeah. Irish? <laughs> Don't worry, you're not going to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Uh, there was a train went now and again, used to go to Mendoon, and sometimes it went down the other way, down to Lifford. And my mother had a great big coat she put on her. And she put stuff in under it, 
But I never heard her talking about them taking anything off, or they would come out and look about, but they, they, they weren't too bad. Yeah. You know? And she would have sugar and tea. They seemed to have plenty of sugar in the free state. Okay. Um, they, th they had sugar beet. Sugar beet is a crop, mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, yeah. And there was always plenty of sugar. And my father loved the sugar. And he'd be looking at, come on, Mum, this sugar's getting small. You soon <laughs> have to go. <laughs> and she would head that way on the, <coughs> on the, it was a train then. Yeah. I suppose she went on her bicycle and the uh, mm -hmm. old man. Yeah. Come on the train there, and away she'd go the sugar and the tea. Yeah. What a bit the the woman with the better not say that. Ah, no, go, go on, go on. Go on. Really? Yeah. yeah. Tell tell the story. It's a good mm. story. Um they all come here and then anyway and this wee woman got very excited. She had her tea and sugar all around her. And she peed herself. <laughs> and she says, What are we then they took the sugar? Yeah. What are we going to do now? The tea is wet. <laughs> and there's no sugar. But I'm sure the tea wasn't wet. She probably didn't wet the tea. That was just a little bit of it. That's a good it's story. A great story and it, doesn't, so. it doesn't lose anything in the telling either. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose that was the reality of it of yeah. it then. You know, you, you had to you right. had to smuggle in the sugar, smuggle in the and tea. Smuggle in the tea and um, some of the houses where there would be five or six children, they would have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there was only two of us, and the mum and daddy, only four of us. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot. Yeah. So, uh, this day there was so much, she got two ounces of butter, but my mother sent us down to the shop. Oh, we Tommy Sugar told me the other day, ask him for two ounces of sugar. A few ounces of butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were down and went in and asked, and it wasn't him, it was the lady that owned the shop that came out the course. We weren't smart enough. We asked for two ounces of butter, and she went down to the shop door. She left the counter. She said, Did Mrs. Brady get her butter? That was my mother. Mm -hmm. And of course, she'd got her butter. Oh. So we got the butter. You got no butter. Yeah, no, you got no butter though. No. Okay. But good to chance your arm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Yeah. Well, in the times that yeah. we're in it. But we loved the butter, and I walked to the house down the road. And Wednesday, my great Solari came round with the groceries, and we got a brown loaf. And there would be some butter, there was quite a few children in the house. And her and I would take two big slices off the slope, put a big pile of butter off and eat it. That was all the butter we seen to mm -hmm. the, the yeah. next week again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, I can understand just one. Mm. No point in trying to just use a wee bit now no, and again. No, just no, get a, we, Just pile it on and, and enjoy. Oh, we, we loved it. The butter and the bread. When you can't get it, it's better, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mary, looking back, you know, and you have your, your big family of, of boys and your daughter, what do you think has been the biggest change from even from your children were born? You know, we, we've we been talking um, with Mary McCartan and that about the way women's lives have changed in the last hundred years. What, what do you think has been the biggest change in your life? Um... Well, it's a happier life now because you have television, you can watch films, and on, in those days you had nothing. You Was just, it a case of really surviving? Just surviving. Yeah. You just sat in the corner and. Uh, uh, some killers. Yeah. The killers. It was a wee man used to come into our house, John Mull, from Taddy Keel. And he used to sing the Irish soldier boy. Right. And we would invite him over to sing it, we thought it was. 
and and the Kaliers would just be be calling in. I, I suppose it's different now. I think in an awful lot of um, an awful lot of homes, and I live out in the country as well. But people just don't pop in anymore. No, they ring you. So my woman would have come in, and she would have put on the kettle, and made tea. Because <laughs> an hour day doors weren't locked or anything. Oh no, because there was nothing. To, well, no. well, presumably there there was. There was no great excess of stuff, so there was nothing to be taken. No. As such. No. Um, the doors were there. Would you still Kaylee? Would you I still be Kaylee with people? Love. I would be a Kaylee or Shirley, but now with this COVID, you see, mm. I just knocked the heels of the Kaylee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So but do you think that Kaylee. life's easier now? As you were saying, with, with TB and maybe with Aye, phones? it's easier. You don't have to go out. You know, for entertainment or mm-hmm. chat, you hear plenty in the house with the, the, even the radio. Yeah. And sometimes that's very good. Yeah. The radio. Look very good. Um, clothes are different now, I think. You know, uh, people long go a big long skirt and a big long coat and... Now they're shorter and they're nicer looking. And well, there's huge variety, isn't and there? And there's a huge variety. Would yeah. your mum have been making your clothes? No, she didn't make clothes, but she knit. She used okay. to knit for us. Yeah. But then, when I got up, when I went for I would have made. I remember Johnson's, W.G. Mm-hmm. Johnson's mm-hmm. always had a great sale after Christmas. Yeah. And I remember buying a lump of cloth and wanting for a pound. And I made one of them wee square jackets and a skirt. Lovely. And I always say, if I hadn't done that, I'd have been naked. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you wouldn't have been, really. Somebody would have taken care of you. <laughs> that would have been tricky in January, Mary. I don't. It would, wouldn't have been great. You'd have the flu. <laughs> You'd have got away with it in June, but not in January. <laughs> that is right. And when you would be Kayleen, um and even whenever you were a child with <clears throat> with your mum and dad and Kayleen and that, uh, because there there wasn't the things like TVs and radios, you know, mm, so... You just chatted. You chatted and you Someone sang. Someone would sing a song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you'd be prone to singing and a song or saying a poem. Maybe there would be a man, I had an uncle, he played the fiddle. Right. And he was very much in demand. Very yeah. good. He was a fiddle player. I think life was simpler, you know, in many respects, it it was simpler, not necessarily easier, but but Uh simpler. It took less to entertain you, I think. Yeah, and maybe there was more, a a more appreciation then. Now everything is so immediate, Mm -hmm. you know. You, you turn a switch and you can be watching something Aye, on the other you side like of the world. And you turn it off and you put on mm-hmm. another one. Yeah. Even true. electricity. You know, we get up, uh, electricity, you, you get up in the morning and put on the electric Aye. kettle, put on the yeah. lights. That's what were you right. doing then for, for light? We had the lamp with the oil in the bottom and a glue bullet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it hung on the wall. Right. And we used to have to clean the globe and be very careful of the globe. Yeah. But it was broke with the man knew it. They were very fragile, mm-hmm. weren't they? Yeah. yeah. Very fragile. And then you told us about your dad and the rushes. What what was yeah. that? Oh, I he dipped, dipped the rushes a bunch into tallow. Yeah. That was for making candles. And they would tie us to the girls and put it up on the wall. And as long as it burned, they had light. Oh. My goodness. And then when it... Well, that was it, that was they it. They were in the dark. Yeah. 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 They had to they have whatever they were doing done for that wee while. Mm-hmm. But I suppose they would have had more for there'd be plenty of rushes. Yeah. yeah. Daddy was a thatcher. He used right. to thatch houses. So. Well. He'd make some money now if he was here thatching. Should they love it? <gasps> Aye, mm. it's come back. Yeah, very much and so. And them days when they thatched house, there was nothing thought of you. And you right? lived in a house like that. You know. My goodness. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. I suppose it's just it's that whole appreciation. Mm-hmm. You know, um life was hard but, but simpler, whereas now life is much easier, yet there are other oh, other uh, worries problems. and problems yeah, right. as well. Yeah. Sometimes close to home so I was talking not. to a wee fella who used to come to our house 
is June Gallagher from Tartary, maybe you know him? Not sure. And uh, he used to come over and he said he admired the turf stack. That Jim, that was my husband, used to mow the lonely big turf stack. Mm -hmm. And that thatched. Yeah. And how he, the, the, uh, he thatched the, the turf. turf really? Uh, to keep them dry. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Needs must. Needs must Needs in the must. Yeah. Well, well, in all times. the big shed to put it in, so they thatched it. Yeah. There was no big blue tarpaulins that they throw no, over no, stuff now. No, that's true. And yeah, Mary, if you were going to leave us with a, a song or a poem, <coughs> or words of wisdom, or any other words of wisdom, would you would you be happy to? What I would, what would I do? I'll do Paddy O'Shea for you. Paddy, Paddy O'Shea would, would be lovely. Wouldn't that be all right? Gorgeous. Uh -huh. It was the month of November at the close of the day. It was also the close of the fair in the village of Gorton and Paddy O'Shea was a little bit worse for the wear. He sold a cow to a man from the plum and the horse to a lad in Corley. I tricked myself now to a wee the upper room. I deserve it, says Paddy O'Shea. He prodded this job along just as blithe as a bee till he came to a seat in the glen. I'll rest and be thankful, says Paddy, says he, for it can't be a lot after ten. When I worked for the council and times was gone by, I rested here many a day. He finished, finished his bottle because he was dry <laughs> and sleep came to Paddy O'Shea. How long he had slept he never could tell, but he swore at his back to the thump. And the sound in his head like the clang of a bell made him come to himself with a jump. And the lad on the seat showed two cloven feet, says you needn't be trying to pray for your sins of the past. I have got you at last. I have come for you, Paddy O'Shea. Now, says Paddy, me lad, were you five times as bad, I would warn you now to take heed. For I don't care for you or the worst you can do. I'm married to one of your breed. <laughs> I tamed her, me dad. I man, she was bad, a daughter of yours, I would say. But I don't give a curse, you can't be no worse than your daughter. <laughs> Paddy would <laughs> say. Now the old boy jumped up on a tear of a rage. He gripped Paddy hard me the beard. So see if I'm slurred. But I'll swear at my age, this is the worst I have heard. Now Paddy by this time was quite wide awake and so it was just breaking day. <laughs> Ach, the devil, says he, I have made a mistake. It's the daughter, says Paddy O'Shea. For Paddy's own woman, she sat up <laughs> all night till her temper was boiling, and then, with a stick in her hand, at the squeak of daylight, she wended her way down the glen. She she yelled, blagger the very cheap, <laughs> but this to your day and day. I'll make you pay for the things that you said in your sleep. <laughs> Bad cess to you, Paddy O'Shea. <laughs> oh, fantastic. You have some memory, Mary. That's brilliant, That Mary. is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for The Girls We Left Behind, for your lovely stories. Well, I sing the Spring of Irish Heaven. We'll do that the next time. Right. I'll be having another time. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. We'll hopefully oh, have we'll other have times you back, Mary, as well. Oh, yeah. right. Definitely. Yeah. Mary, we're going to cross over now to Philea Sophia. They're go we're going to be singing a song, and I, this song could be written for you. It's called Ain't Misbehaving. Well, I, I doubt do you, that, Mary. Do you say that with a twinkle in your eye? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Philea Sophia with Ain't Misbehaving. Yeah. 
shelf ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you. I know for certain the one I love. I'm through with flirting. It's just you I'm dreaming of. Ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you. Don't care to go. I'm hope about late, just me and the radio. Ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you. I'm saving my love. 